Eisenhower, uh, remember the whole, the whole, the, the, the hope was they would be able to take Tunis by, um, you know, within a few weeks of the torch landings. But the Germans, as we know, just rush units there, they fortify it. So right after Christmas, Eisenhower reorganizes uh, the eastern elements of the Eastern Task Force, the, pardon me, the Center Task Force, into um, the United States Second Corps. Now, the Second Corps had existed. The Second Corps had actually been in England under Mark Clark, but they'd been cannibalizing so many units and whatever that it was kind of a, it wasn't an official designation there for a bit. So he reorganizes the Second Corps. And because uh, most of the staff that he took for the Second Corps came from the Center Task Force, he just um, assigns, and he, and he considered this, he assigned Lloyd Frendendahl. We talked about the Center Task Force commander. He assigned Lloyd Frendendahl the command of the Second Corps. Now, Eisenhower did not know Frendendahl before Operation Torch, before he came to England for Operation Torch. He'd never met Frendendahl. And Eisenhower had actually suggested some other generals to, 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 to do the Oran operation. Um, Russell Hartle, who was um, commanding American forces in Northern Ireland at the moment, uh, was, was Eisenhower's choice. And Marshall said he didn't think Hartle would do a good job. So George Marshall uh, pretty much kind of foists Lord Frendendal, uh, Lloyd Frendendahl on Eisenhower. So Eisenhower takes it, and then Eisenhower doesn't know what to make of the guy. He's not his pick, but he does a pretty good job in taking Oran. And Marshall considered Oran the key to the torch landing there. So Eisenhower's kind of favorably impressed with, with Frendendahl, and so he, give, he kicks him up to this, to, to this core, uh, newly formed core here. And the whole, uh, by this point, you have British, British units here uh, as well. Um, and one of the reasons why you don't have a lot of British participation in landing in North Africa is still there's a lot of bitter feelings between the French and the British after, like, Operation Catapult and a lot of that. There's still a lot of... In fact, at one point, Churchill suggested they actually land British troops under the Stars and Stripes, and Eisenhower's no, we're not, we're not going to have foreign troops fight under the American flag. So, and so, so it was decided it'd be better if, if this is primarily an American operation because there was less animosity from the French toward toward the Americans than toward the British. So he gets Lloyd Friend and all kind of hoisted upon him, but he actually is pretty impressed with him in Oran, so he gives him this job. So what's happening now is uh, I wish I had my laser pointer. Um, you have the Germans are pretty much occupying uh, Bizerte and Tunis and all the way down the coast here. And you have the United States Second Corps then start moving into position to make a push onto, onto Tunis, right? And there's, there's several battles here, like in November and December, and, uh, between the American forces. But when they organized the Second Corps here, the idea is it would, it would be the instrument whereby it would push in and, and take the, um, these, these ports. Well, the problem is Lloyd Frendendahl suddenly shows himself to be incredibly timid. And he's not pushing. He's, he's, he's doing these like little raids here or there and kind of patting himself on the back for these just little pinprick raids. He's not pushing the, the um, Second Corps into, further into this German-held territory. And what's more than that, Frenendahl has, shall we say, a heightened sense of his own safety. Um, he does not go near the front. He thinks a modern battlefield can entirely be conducted by telephone and radio and a commander. There's no need for a commander to go to the front. And so consequently, he builds his... He's got his front line here. Back in these hills, he builds his uh, headquarters about 60 miles behind the front line. About 60 miles behind the front line. And he actually has a corps of engineers dig it into the rock. So essentially create a cave system to build it. Because he kept remarking about how scary the threat of enemy air raids were. And the Luftwaffe actually had some, some significant, comparatively significant air power here. So he was very, he'd make remarks. He was in a press conference once, and he's in the middle of a press conference, and you hear some planes, and he pauses, and he looks up and goes, oh, I hope they're ours. You know, and, and there was another instance where he goes to meet Terry, Terry Della Mason Alla, who was commanding the 1st Division, and they're out in the middle of a road. 
and uh, they, I, I can't remember if it was artillery fire or, or enemy aircraft, but they start shooting, not necessarily at them, but near them, and Terry Allen, you know, he kind of crouches down near his Jeep, and then he gets up, and he looks, and he sees in a ditch next to the road a pile of men. Friend and all was at the bottom. His men had piled on top of him to protect him, right? The guy was a little too concerned with his own safety. Let's, let's be generous and say that, okay? Eisenhower's writing letters saying, you, you need to be more aggressive. You need to, come on, you need to move. You need to make things happen here. And he's not really responding to it. Well, this is all well and good. In fact, um, <coughs> Kenneth Anderson, um, so, so technically the second, the second Corps is organized now under a British unit called the British First Army. Okay, so you have the British First Army. It's under a general named Kenneth Anderson, and then Eisenhower's over the British First Army. Okay, so you got Eisenhower, the British First Army, which has several units, including the American Second Corps. Kenneth Anderson actually said to Eisenhower, he was talking about Frendendall, he says, surely you've got better men than this. I mean, Frendendall, I mean, there's a lot of warning signs here, okay? Now, they're very, they're still, the Army in a way is still kind of an old boys network, right? And now Frendendall was not a West Point graduate, as, as Eisenhower was, but there's still a sense of trying to look out for everybody. And the problem is you can't really do that in wartime because people's lives are on the line. And this is clearly an incompetent commander. Okay. No, pardon me. It was Harold Alexander that said you had better men than that. He was, he was another British officer. It wasn't Anderson. It was Alexander. But anyway, one thing Frenadol does, too, is he doesn't really concentrate his force. He kind of has it spread out. And he has it spread out in such a way. Now, like if you're defending, it's, it can be a good thing to spread out if you have, like, interlocking fields of fire and you can support each other. But he's got his units pretty far spread out on this, on this uh, plane here. So this, he, he's, the way he's, he's setting out his, his units is pretty scary. And what's really scary is what happens here in the middle of February of 1942. The Germans attack. And this is the Battle of the Kasserine Pass. You can see Kasserines right here. Okay, Kasserines here. So this is the Battle of the Kasserine Pass. And this is essentially an attack by Erwin Rommel. Erwin Rommel uh, had assembled a force here in order to essentially hit hard against the Second Corps, hit hard against the Americans. Uh, there's a belief the Americans were green, which was, of course, correct. Um, but also, too, he thinks, you know, he's got Montgomery behind him coming from Egypt, and he, he realizes this is what, what they're doing. They're going to try to squeeze him. So he thinks Montgomery's too... too powerful, but if I hit these kind of green Americans, um, maybe I can force them back far enough that I can buy time and breathing room for us to continue fighting here in North Africa. So this, in this battle, um, in the vicinity of the uh, of Kasserine of the attack, the United States, the United Kingdom, and free French forces number about 30,000 men, number about 30,000 men. So the Allies, about 30,000 men. Rommel's got about 22,000 men under his command. So Rommel's outnumbered. Okay? By nearly a third. And yet, Rommel hits with such aggressive spirit, with such fighting power, that the um, Americans, they're not in positions to support each other. They begin to fall back. And what, to make matters worse, is just as Rommel is doing this, the Allies are kind of reorganizing their air command. So no one kind of knew exactly who to take orders from because they're kind of integrating it between the British and the Americans. And so there's poor air response. And some of the airfields were too far forward, and they're actually quickly overrun by the Germans. So this is the very... So the Kasserine Pass, this is the very first battle of World War II in which the U.S. Army is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Wehrmacht. Okay? The U.S. Army is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Wehrmacht. And Rommel's attack devastates the Second Corps. As I say, American units, some, in some cases, they're not even retreating. They, it, it's a rout. They're throwing their stuff down and they're running. Now, this goes on for several days. Eventually, the Americans are able to kind of regroup, reorganize, and the British kind of come to bear. And they're able to hold the tide. But really, fundamentally, what stops Rommel here more than anything is... He runs out of gas. 
he runs out of gas and he runs out of the the ability to sustain the offensive. So on February 23rd, Rommel calls off the attack and he begins to fall back on Tunisia and his supply bases. Overall, in this battle, there were 3,000... The Allies take 3,000 men killed and about another 3,000 captured and wounded. Another 3,000 captured and wounded. The Germans lose about 1,600 men killed, captured, and wounded. So about 1,600 casualties total for the Germans. So about 1,600 casualties for the Germans to 6,000 casualties for the Allies. Okay? Despite the fact that it's an ultimate victory, pretty much everyone sees this as a fiasco. The United States Army got its clocks cleaned. If the Germans had been better supplied, potentially, they who knows what damage they could have done to the United States Army here, okay? The U.S. Army just simply was not ready for it. And again, a lot of the fault you have to lay at the feet of Lloyd Frendendahl. Um, during the battle, once the battle begins, he freaks out. And... Eisenhower's scared to death because he realizes he's got this guy there who doesn't know what he's doing. So he instructs a division commander who was working for for, um, Patton. His name was uh, Ernest Harmon. He sends Ernest Harmon to Frenendahl's command center. And by this time, Frenendahl had moved. He was a little closer to the front by this point. But he sends this guy to the command center. And now, and and, uh, uh, Frenendahl this time is a a two-star general. And I think the guy that arrives, I think Harmon this time, was either a one-star or just a newly minted two-star. But friend and all outranked Harmon. Harmon comes up to him, asks for the situation, and he tells them. And friend and all looks at Harmon and says, "What do you think? Should we retreat?" I mean, he's asking this junior officer who just arrived if he should retreat. And Harmon said, "Hell no, we'll stay and fight." Friend and all, friend, friend and all says, "Yes, that's what I think too." Uh, placing you in, in command, I, I need to, to 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 take a step outside for a minute. He proceeds to his uh, uh, quarters, and he takes a nap for a, literally 24 hours. For a day, he is incommunicado. Some, by some accounts, he was drunk. Um, he fell apart. He couldn't do it. He just didn't know how to do it. And I could go on and on talking about other problems with Frenendahl. Frenendahl's just a total incompetent. Shortly after the battle, he will be relieved of command, and he'll be sent back. And again, even again, this is something I don't understand. They're still looking out for this guy. They promote him to lieutenant general, three-star general, and they give him a training army back in the United States. They say, well, he can still train people. It's like, you know, there comes a point where you just need to realize this guy is not very good and get rid of him. But um, Eisenhower was looking out for him, had some sense of loyalty toward the guy for whatever reason. Um, And then, most crucial of all, do you know where Lloyd Frendendahl was from? Laramie, Wyoming. One thing, too, um, in, those, in those battles like in, in November and December is they're trying to make their way toward the, um, trying to make their way toward the uh, Tunis. Uh, there's one battle where we have an American captain by the name of John Waters is captured by the Germans. Uh, and John Waters is significant, uh, among other things. He was Patton's son-in-law. And he's taken back to Germany. And later in the war, that's going to lead to some problems for Patton, as we'll see. But he, uh, his uh, son-in-law is taken prisoner here. You've need, you need to see it. It's a great film. But right at the very beginning, it's, this is where the movie starts out. Right after the Battle of Catherine Pass, and Eisenhower takes command of the Second Corps, and he kind of is trying to whip that unit back into shape here. 